welcome to the Brand Theory Podcast, the podcast for helping you uncover your passion, realize your purpose, and take the aligned action. Together, we're going to prove the theory that when we live our lives on brand, the possibilities become limitless. I'm your host, Danielle Marchesi, branding expert and business coach. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Brand Theory Podcast, where we bring you conversations of high value and high inspiration to help you along your entrepreneurial journey and to build the best brand and business possible for yourself and for your community. Today, I'm so excited to be talking to Tristan Tristan Thibodeau. She is a fellow brand geek, as we call ourselves, and we dove in on all things branding, strategy, visuals, all the things about branding. And it's it, it, again, it was one of those episodes that really I just knew I had to talk to her, and I'm so glad that we were able to connect and get this episode recorded. It it spoke life into me as a brand strategist and as a business owner, and I love her perspective on all things branding and business procedures, and I know you guys are going to get so much goodness out of this episode, so we're going to dive in in just a second. Quick reminder to book your brand audit, take your brand to the doctor. We all need that check-in once in a while. I have given myself a doctorate from Grey's Anatomy, but a unofficial um, qualifications to help you doctor your brand and help you take a look and audit your procedures, audit your strategies, audit your visuals to see if everything is aligning to where you actually want to go and who you actually want to be helping. In our five years of business, two years of business, one or even six months of business, sometimes things change, things adjust. What we want to be offering is not what we want to be offering six months from now to five years from now. And that is okay. I'm giving you permission and telling you that that is okay. Lord knows I have changed my direction at least four to five times since starting my business five years ago. So sometimes we're just too close to see what needs to be adjusted. And that's what I am here for. So reminder to book that in. Link is in the show notes and there is a cute little discount code for you. So now let us talk to Tristan Thibodeau. She is a brand strategist and mentor and is the CEO and founder of Wild Women House, a collab- a collaborative and all-inclusive branding agency that specializes in creating brands that are designed to be industry disruptors with impact. I love it. Tristan believes that your brand is the key to not only attracting your ideal clients, but to positioning yourself as an unparalleled unparalleled, and highly influential leader in your industry and in the world at large. <sighs> Powerful. As a woman of many career pivots herself, guilty, Tristan has seen firsthand the benefit of having a strong brand that can evolve with you as you grow and develops as an entrepreneur. Hello, yes, <laughs> to all of it. Embracing the identity as Jack of all trades has landed Tristan spots on the news on radio and TV in magazines and countless other opportunities that Tristan credits the strength of and versatility of her brand. After years of entrepreneurship, having built multiple businesses and serving as a mentor and coach to female entrepreneurs, Tristan now supports her community in using their brand to scale their own business and bring their vision for big impact and big income to life. Let's dive in. Welcome to the show, Tristan. I'm so excited to geek out with you. I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Guys, you've got two brand geeks in this room. So buckle up. This is going to be the ride of your life. Um, but of course, <laughs> before we dive into all things branding, tell us about a little bit more about who you are. I know we heard about you and in your intro, but tell us about your journey thus far and how you got to be a brand geek. Yeah. Excuse the clink while I set my coffee mug down. All good. <laughs> So my journey into branding, I've been an entrepreneur since 2016 and shock alert, I actually started my entrepreneurial journey as a nutrition coach and as a, yeah, right? Big That is a shock alert. (laughs) Big twists and events. And my educational background is actually in nutrition, but I grew up being a creative and being obsessed with art and illustration and was convinced that I was going to go to art school. So age 16, 17, I was touring all of these different art schools. Like, and there's part of me that wanted just to go to a super prestigious school. So I was like, okay, SDA in New York, like RISD in Rhode Island, which is right near Brown, like all of these really cool schools. Cause art was my life. And something happened where People that were advising me, you know, in high school, we had this kind of curriculum to help you map out your professional trajectory. And I don't remember if it was 
shockingly an art teacher or if it was just some somebody something said in passing but they're like you know that whole struggling artist thing is real and for whatever reason that completely killed my hopes and dreams of becoming an artist and in terms of which path in art I wasn't really sure where I was going to go graphic design if I was going to actually go into branding if I was I didn't know I just knew that I wanted to be an artist and so that killed everything. And there was this school where I'm from in Ohio that gave me an incredible full ride, like not a full ride, but pretty close to a full ride scholarship um, to come in as a liberal arts student. So English writing, those sorts of things. So I was like, well, I got the money there and I'm not gonna become an artist. So let's go to school. And even though I didn't wanna go there, that's where I went and ended up again, having these fears of how am I going to create a lifestyle where I have ample resources to travel, to have a nice, like higher scale lifestyle. And so it was all of these fears that kind of pushed me out of the art world. And then I went into nutrition because I grew up in a family that was all about exercise, all about taking care of your body, all about uh, eating well and all of these things. And I swear to God, my grandma is going to outlive every single one of my family members because of how well she takes care of her body. So in my mind, I was like, okay, well, this is a quote unquote safe career path because there's so much data on what the average dietitian makes. So I'll just do that. And it was a soul sucking experience. Like mm. I loved it from the standpoint of I, it was a familiar arena for me because of how I grew up and how focused I was on health and wellness and also just that whole arena. But I went through four, like four years of college and then got a full ride to do a grad program to become a dietitian for dietetics and hated it, like literally hated it. Everything in me hated it. And I thought it was just because I was going to have to work for somebody else, right? And so I'm like, oh, well, I'll just start my own business and that will solve everything. And I swear in that first like one to two year period of entrepreneurship, I made every single mistake that you can possibly make in the book when it comes to marketing, when it comes to sales, when it comes to branding, when it comes to telling your story and attracting your audience, I made every mistake in the book. So I always say that that was kind of my, you know, offhand education on entrepreneurship because because I made so many mistakes, I also learned how to do things correctly in a way that was relevant and timely to what was happening in the world where everything was shifting. It had been, but everything was shifting even more rapidly to digital, right? And so I learned as I was going, as I was building the best way to talk to your audience, the best way to market, the best way to brand. And through that experience and through the experience of growing a business and seeing how naturally it came to me as a communicator and as a visual person and as somebody that just genuinely takes care of clients as if they were family, the whole process of marketing became something that was just really natural. And it was at that point where, you know, the pandemic was happening and nobody wanted you coming into their home to consult what I was doing previously. So I kind of had to think on my feet and do a 180 pivot and completely reinvent myself as a professional. And that's ultimately where I dove deep into self-education and learning and really getting clear on how I was going to position myself as a marketing expert. And what I love to say about branding is that at the end of the day, it comes down to empathy. How deeply can you understand your target audience? And being somebody that has always been extremely empathetic, it came so naturally to me to be able to get into somebody's brain and understand their desires and understand their problems and understand how to communicate with that person and build a deep relationship. So that came that felt so good to be able to use part of just who I was as a human in a professional capacity. And so without taking up any more time, that's kind of the long story, short story long of how I got into branding. And it is something that literally lights my heart on fire and that my clients always mention how freaky it is to the degree that I get into their head and understand mm. their vision and understand what they're trying to bring to life. So it's a super unconventional path but it is something that is so original and true to me as a woman that it is the most fulfilling career path and profession and just like craft 
that yeah. I have encountered yet in my life and I'm 29. And so it's just like, I don't see myself doing anything else. I love this. I absolutely I, love what I'm doing. That, I, I love that story. Every portion of it, I was like inching closer and closer, trying to like jump through the screen to hear it more in person. Um, I feel like a lot of brand strategists that I have come across never set out to go into branding, right? Like, or I should even say branding as it exists today didn't exist when we were in college, even <laughs> I'm 29 too. So it just wasn't there. It wasn't like it is now. Um, but same thing. I, I did website and brand design, but I didn't expect to love branding to the level of everything it is. And something that I always like to talk about with other brand strategists is I feel like everybody has their own definition of what branding is. And every time I hear someone else's, I'm like, yeah, that's it. I love that. I love that. And you kind of touched on it yours already with the empathy portion of it, which I truly feel that as well. It's, it's almost like creepy when we can get so inside our our customers minds and deliver information that sounds just like them or offer the perfect meme in their social media strategy. Like, wow, that I couldn't have picked that one better myself. So what is your kind of definition on brand, brand strategy, branding? Yeah. So there's this really cool explanation that somehow I developed from working with people because I found that just the general public doesn't understand the landscape of what brand and branding is. When we think of brand, most people immediately go to the visual identity of a brand. They think of logo, they think of color palette, they think of the actual product itself. So when you pick a product off the shelf or when you're talking about a service-based business, you say, oh, that brand, as in something that is, you know, contained into a tangible concept. And really what brand is, it is a relationship between you and your target audience. So to kind of back up, the way I love to say this is that brand strategy is identifying what makes you unique. Your branding is expressing visually that story. And then your marketing is putting words to everything that you've created through the brand strategy and the branding in a way that connects with the target audience. And so when it comes down to understanding what brand is, it's an ecosystem. It's not a product. It is not a logo. It is not a color palette. And it is an ecosystem that thrives off of a back and forth communication between the founder or the creator and the audience. It's this living, breathing entity that continually evolves and strengthens and grows based on that relationship. And so if you have a product that has a logo and a color palette and a specific typography, but there's no story, there's no emotion, there's no way for people to self-identify, you have a product, you don't have a brand. Same thing with service-based. If you're like purely showing up on social media or in your marketing and you're saying, this is what I sell, this is what I do, these are the results that I get, and that's where you stop, you don't have a brand, you have a service. The brand is, like I said, that back and forth exchange of the audience self-identifying with the story that you're telling and then you getting feedback from them about what are they looking for more? How can I be of even deeper service to this individual? How can I create an actual community? How can I create culture? How can we all come together based on shared values? That's the ecosystem of your brand. And then Marty Neumeyer always says this, it's not what you say it is, it's what they say it is. Mm -hmm. So you can try and create a concept of what you want people to think your brand is, but at the end of the day, It's what the consumer says. It's what the audience says. And so brand management, to throw another term in, is ultimately that relationship where you are interacting with the perception of what the brand is. And then you're coming in and evaluating, is this what we're trying to represent? So there's brand strategy, branding, marketing, and then brand management, right? So that's kind of the way that I like to describe it, but simply, very simply, it's an ecosystem. Yeah. I don't, I actually don't think I've ever heard it described like that of the ecosystem and how all of the different pieces of it really do work together. Have you ever read the brand story, story builder? I think that's what it's called. Okay. So you know how Miller. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I love the way he explains that the customer is your hero of the story and you are not the hero because I think it's very easy to position ourselves as the hero as we have the perfect solution to your problems and we offer the perfect solution solution to whatever transition that you need we we can do that for you but they need to be able to see themselves as that hero who can make the transition on their own with you as that guide i love that explanation and that's what popped into my head when you were saying story because you were right without any kind of story that your audience can resonate to your brand just completely falls flat. It is, it is, there's no personal tie to it. And if I can't have a personal tie to your business, I'm not saying I would never buy from you. Like I don't have a personal tie to my grocery stores that I go to. Right. But (laughs) I have a personal tie to people who I'm going to be working very closely with invest this time and invest this financial, um, this, this money into, I want to make sure that, uh, your values align with mine, that your mission aligns, aligns with mine. I also think that everything you were saying kind of goes into what I like to say of branding is the opportunity for us to invite our audience to join us on our bigger mission. Absolutely. And there's another concept that I am absolutely obsessed with, and it's called preferred identity. So that's a little foreshadowing and let me back up. So where marketing and sales used to thrive is by positioning the brand as the hero. I have the solution to your problems. I'm here to save the world. And really what that came down to was there wasn't a story of relationship or community or culture. There was a story of product quality and superiority. That's the way that people used to make purchases is who's the best, who has the best reputation and the best the best quality, and that's where my money's gonna go, right? That is not the way consumers invest and make purchases in today's era. The way consumers make purchases now is based on which brands align with the way that they prefer to see themselves. So what that means is that concept of preferred identity. And we see this all the time with brands that get that cult following. There's a brand that's called Mayfair Group that's local to Arizona where they sell really fun, funky, approachable apparel that's meant for both millennial and Gen Z audiences. But they have all of these super cute quotes on the front that talk about being vulnerable and authentic. So they have this one that says, like, I cry a lot. They have this one that says empathy on the front and that brand is incredibly powerful because of the story and the culture and the community that they're creating around that acceptance to mental health and Mm -hmm. how relevant is that with everything going on with the pandemic right so the preferred identity of that customer is somebody that wants to embrace taking care of their mental health and wants to normalize the fact that hey i cry a lot or hey let's just be good humans to each other the identity they're taking on when they wear that apparel is that they are an empathetic person or they are a good person or that they are somebody that cares about others or they are somebody that is in tune with their emotions. And so they're taking on, they're representing, they're projecting a specific identity out to the world every single time they wear that shirt. And so this is easier to explain with a product based, but even Mm -hmm. with service based, something like if I'm working with, what's a really easy example, like a business coach, If I'm working with a business coach and this business coach's brand has the reputation of being bold, badass, risk-taking, when I work with that person and then I share that I'm working with that person, people assume that I am also that identity. So it's it's this source of social proof and social currency, but it's also the internalized identity of what it means for me to be working with a business coach that is all of those things because now I'm like her, I'm closer in proximity to that identity, right? Yeah. That's the way consumers make purchases. You simply cannot sell on quality and superiority alone. It's the story, it's the culture, it's the value that you're providing through that preferred identity that people get to take on. Yeah, I've heard my clients explain exactly what you just explained just with a different title called the prosumer. And it's true, how people bought things 
even three years ago is so different now. So how do let's dive more into how would somebody check in with their brand and their marketing strategies to make sure they are allowing for that kind of shared collective, that shared mission and inviting that person into feeling safe being buying a service. Yeah, absolutely. So first things first is it's even myself, I'll admit this, I, this is what I do. And I still sometimes forget to do this is we have to talk about our story all of the time. It's not enough to just have it on your website and then go about your day creating content for sales mm -hmm. or connection. You have to literally talk about it all the time. And that doesn't mean just rattling off the same sentence or the same phrases every single day. It means holding that purpose and that culture that you have and those values and intertwining it with everything that you do with copy and content. Your mission and your vision and your purpose and who you are and what you do and why you do what you do should not just live on your website. It should not just be in your signature of your emails. It should not just be in the bio of your Instagram. It needs to live and breathe with everything that you do. Like if you think about it, your mission is literally what you're setting out to do. And if you don't have an emotional connection to your mission, you're not going to talk about it. So right. first and foremost, you as the founder and the creator and the business owner, you need to have that emotional connection to your vision and to your mission. If you don't, you're going to have problems because you're not going to want to talk about it. It's not going to be exciting for you. So that's the first thing in terms of helping people feel safe and magnetized to you and attracted to you is you have to make sure and pull those core pieces of your story into your everyday as often as possible. And we see certain brands do this extremely, extremely well to where it's just like second nature to them to talk about these things. So that's number one. Number two is you have to open two way communication and dialogue between you and your audience. And a lot of people will build relationships with certain members of their audience but if you have the same people hopping into your DMs or responding to your emails or whatever it may be, that means that you're really zoomed in on that particular type of segment or archetype within your audience. But what about everybody else? How can we diversify who we're talking to so that you are attracting a more complex target audience to you and people feel like they're actually part of a community instead of just having a relationship with you, right? Mm. So it's, we have to ask ourselves those questions. How do I make this a community instead of just me to you relationship, right? So those are kind of the big things that help people to feel like they're actually part of a brand instead yeah. of just interacting with a person. So how, how do you recommend starting a community now? Like I know in the past, a lot of it was Facebook groups. I personally feel like there's still a space for them, but they're kind of on their way out um, mm -hmm. to create a new one. So what do you suggest to kind of create a safe community? Yeah, like Facebook is so interesting, right? So like interesting. So in I'm working with a brand right now whose Facebook page still gets crazy high engagement like it did when lives and everything first came out right it's bizarre like, wow that's bizarre because that's not that's not the average so whatever you're that's doing, not what my stats say <laughs> no that's not what the stats say um and then you have people and I, I think you know not to get off on a tangent but with Facebook like I think it's age dependent and it's also kind of industry dependent and so I find that like older like mid to elder quote unquote elder millennials like tends to still work on facebook but to answer your question how do we create that community there's a ton of different ways and there's uh what's the book hold on let me look at my bookshelf there's a book that i read um i'll have to let you know so you can put it in the show notes but it talks about naming your community super fan super fan, super fan. Kathleen. yeah I'm gonna write it super down fans. um and there's this concept of naming your community. And my brand is called Wild Woman House. And I love so, that name, by the way. I'm obsessed. So it's like good. part of my blood. I literally have it I tattooed it. on my body. I like, was it's, it's just going to say that would make an amazing tattoo. <laughs> it's literally on my arm. <laughs> love um, it. So what he talks about, and this is something that I did unintentionally, but then when I read it, I was like, oh, this is an actual strategy is to give your community a name. So I call my community wild women. And because there is this association of what that term means, people want to self-identify with it. 
they want to self-identify with it. They're like, I want to be a wild woman or I am a wild woman. Hell yeah. Ow, ow. Like here I am. Mm -hmm. Right. So naming your community is something that feels really intimate. It feels really personal. And it's something that actually strengthens your brand because then you have that element, you have that term or that phrase that people can self-identify with preferred identity. I want to be a wild woman. I want people to know I am a wild woman. And also it helps you to create that intimacy because yeah. instead of just saying, Hey guys, or Hey fam, or Hey, whatever, Hey tribe. I don't know. That word's a little problematic. Like whatever we say, right. Everybody can say that, but yeah. only you can call your tribe. Like we see this with entrepreneur on fire. He calls his on his community fire nation. Right. That's so we see this too. happening. That's a good one. Right. Yeah. So that's a really strong one. Um, in terms of building community, I think there's, we're seeing a huge shift and user generated content is not anything new, but giving your audience and your community the opportunity to be featured with your brand. Mm. And this is super easy for like apparel and for product. It's also something you can totally do as like client shout outs or community shout outs if you're service based. So this is available to everybody, but that gives people the opportunity to say, oh, I'm actually a valuable member of this community because I'm showing up. My, my face is literally right there. Like that's mm -hmm. me. They get yeah. to feel valuable and you're giving them a startup moment. And then I would say the other thing is, you know, we've talked about naming your community we've talked about user generated content. I would say the other thing is to be really cognizant of how you interact with people and not to put yourself on a pedestal. Like yeah. you want to be expert, you want to be professional, you want to be authoritative and all of these things, but user or consumers are shifting towards needing to feel that connection with a brand to be able to make those investments and to be able to just engage with the brand. Yeah. So making sure that you are communicating and engaging and that your copy is something that feels it's not even relatable, but it's that genuine heart. People want to feel that. And yeah, I will say that the industry kind of shifts that based on what exactly you're doing, but there's always a way to feel genuine. And I think that's just what consumers are looking for. I think there's, if you, if I read a social media caption and somebody mentions, um, I don't know, a show that I've never seen before, but they're showing that they like the show. There's some, there might even be like an inside joke that I miss, but the fact that they're talking about something that's kind of fun for them and they're pulling that into their brand, I can see their personality way better than if it's just a click a link in the bio, not that that's not necessary, but what I'm trying to say is adding these little things aren't going to resonate with every single person personally, but they are going to resonate on the level of being a human. And I think that's very, very important to just be human into, especially as we move into web three, it's all about the human connection. And going back to what we keep saying is consumers are extremely different and they're extremely proactive and they want to connect with a brand on a human level. Mm -hmm. They are smart. Yes, so, they are. <laughs> you cannot, can I curse? Oh yeah. You cannot bullshit people these days. They can smell it. I mean, consumers can smell a lack of being, and I hate to use the word authentic because I think it's so like washed out, but they can, they can smell it. If you're being, if you don't have a connection, like and we see this with influencer marketing, right? You can literally, it's black and white. You can feel when an influencer is reading a script and they don't genuinely care about a product. And you're like, okay, I can tell yeah. that you're selling versus somebody, and there's nothing wrong with selling. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, but it has to do with you genuinely believing in something. Cause, and now we're getting into, I don't want to go on a tangent, but now we're getting into influencers is like, and I work with a lot of influencers. So this is kind of why I'm passionate about it is with being an influencer, you are providing the brands that you influence for so many benefits because you are providing them a shortcut to trust building. Because mm -hmm. as the influencer, you have built trust with your audience to where they come to you knowing that when they ask for a recommendation or when you give a recommendation, you genuinely care about it. You genuinely believe in it. 
So what happens when brands like take too much control of user generated influencer generated content and they say you have to say this we need this amount of content we need you to be doing this. You're destroying that built in credibility and trust that the influencer has worked so hard to build with their community right. I am like very impressed at how articulate you are for the short amount of time that you've been calling yourself a brand and marketing strategist about explaining this. And this, again, this is why I love having conversations with brand strategists because it's like, oh my God, yes. Everything you were saying, it's like, they're, they're, what did you say about the, the trust thing? Oh, they're, they're like, yeah, they're leveraging the built-in trust. Leverage, so yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, so we talk about touch points, the amount of touch points that an individual mm-hmm. needs to feel safe to make a purchase or to trust the brand to make a purchase, right? The average touch point is like nine, right? Seven mm-hmm. to nine. Yep. So the average touch point is seven to nine, which means that brand needs to be in front of the consumer in a value-driven way to where they are validly considering purchasing from that brand, right? What the influencer does is they come in and they say these this batch this audience this community they already trust me with their whole heart and soul which Mm. means as the brand working with that influencer you dramatically cut down on the amount of trust that you have to build with the brand because you've got that person doing it literally for you yeah and i don't think i i am so passionate about this because like i said i work with a lot of influencers that have huge followings that do a lot of collabs And it is so frustrating to see brands that care more about their bottom line than they do about appreciating the creator and the influencer and giving them freedom to market in their own way because that's what their audience expects. Yeah, they can't be expected to market in the way that completely matches the brand that they're marketing for. They need to then adapt that. They need to be able to have the freedom to adapt that product, that service into their own brand. Because like you said, they've already have this trust of how they have positioned their brand, how they have positioned their values and everything that they have worked so hard in their brand to do. It needs to still be able to fit their brand and their identity. Yeah. I, we could, again, go on this for I know, hours. right? Like, where do you want to go? Because I can just jump down this rabbit hole with you if you're on board. Like you, you're the, you're the captain right now. So. I know. Oh man, I'm going to have to fly you out here so we can go talk about this and get some coffee yes, or something. I would love that. <laughs> um, okay. Let's transition a little bit into if somebody is looking to scale their brand, to create even more trust, to create even more of a community, what are some tips you have for that? Oh, okay. So let's say we're working with a brand and I'm assuming if a brand has not built a lot of trust, there's two things happening. If they haven't built trust in community, there's two things happening. One, the brand has in some way not stayed relevant with the way that we market and interact with the community. So maybe they launched it. This is actually the story of a brand I'm working with right now. So I'm just going to use this as an example. Um, Let's say that a brand launched many, many years ago and was booming during the era of quality and superiority, right? That's how they got their name to fame is through being high quality. But then things shifted in the consumer brand relationship to where now you need to be building that community. You need to be building that culture. You need to have a story. Otherwise, nobody's going to purchase based on quality alone. So let's say that happened, right? So now the brand is in a position where they have to build, they have to build community. They have to build culture in order to A, be relevant, but also survive, make sales, right? So let's just say that's the situation. Where you start is you have to decide in, is my story as the founder going to be intertwined with the brand or am I going to create a story based off of what the consumer is looking for, right? So there's kind of these two approaches that brands can take is if the founder wants to be the face of the brand and if the founder wants to be heavily involved in that community engagement, your story of why you started this brand or why you own this brand or why you acquired this brand should be intertwined with the brand story because that's where all of the passion that's where all of the heart that's where all of the authenticity and the genuineness is going to come from if you are a founder and we can just say like 
I'm going to keep using Mayfair Group because I'm obsessed with them right now. Mayfair Group, the founders are not the face of the brand. The community is, right? So the story revolves around the story of the consumer, right? They manufactured, or not manufactured like falsely, but they created that story to revolve around the consumer versus the story of the founder interacting with the story of the consumer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that definition. That's so true. And that again, like that's a perfect way to articulate the difference between a brand that wants to be the face of it and be the leader of the community and the, a brand that wants their community to be the leader of the brand. I love that. Right. And like Jonathan Van Ness is such a great example of this. Like he has started his own hair care line and everything, and he is the face of the brand and he's also a personal brand, right? Mm. So he could have launched that product line and had it been community face of the brand. But yeah. because of how good he is at building community just as a person, it makes total sense for him to be the face of the brand because now he yeah. has so much more leverage in terms of sales and visibility because of who he is as a person. And there's nothing right or wrong about either approach. It's just knowing, it's knowing your story, knowing your strengths, and also knowing what's going to resonate best with the, with the consumer. Mm, I love that. I feel like we're coming to a close and I just want to keep going. I just want to know I everything, know, right? all That's your opinions, said, all like, your perspectives. We're going to geek. <laughs> <laughs> we I love it. <laughs> The last question I always ask everyone is we define the term on brand here as living. And I want to change this word as well, authentically and truly in alignment with yourself. It's just like, again, like a year ago, those terms were still okay to use and still like not overused. And now I'm like, eh, I can't, if only the definition wasn't on all the products we have on our website. <laughs> but anyway, so the question is, was there a time in your business and you kind of already shared that they, there was or your life where you were living not on brand, not in alignment with who you are, your own brand mission, your own personal mission? And how did you recognize that? And how did you navigate back to being on brand? Um, welcome to the first half of my life. <laughs> like, honestly. Um, and, you know, I come from a, a challenging personal background where I experienced a lot of difficult and you know, traumatic situations to be completely transparent that kind of taught me to be small and taught me to, which I don't know how, try and keep my mouth shut as much as possible because I'm clearly a very verbose person. But you know, the experiences that we have in our life are one of the biggest things that contribute to the way that we express our personality. And I would say at least the first half, if not the first three quarters of my life were feeling very lost and confused about my place in the world and how, who I am as a woman fit into a, what we're expected to be as women societally and culturally, but then also how I fit into being what other people expect me to be in terms of family and friends and things like that. And the off brand part was there was an era in my life and this was like my rebellion moment as a teenager where I literally like cut, I used to have hair down my butt, cut it all off, dyed it, like just went to the extreme of, I am going to break every rule that people tell me that I have to follow to figure out who I am and what I believe in. And it was during that era that it, it's not even the actions I was taking or the things that I was believing in. It was more so the feeling that I got from that level of freedom. And I lost that freedom for a lot of my life for a lot of different reasons. And so being on brand for me is that feeling of, it's that feeling of freedom. It's that feeling of, this is what I believe. This is what I value. This is who I feel like being today. This is what I feel like saying. This is what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and not stopping myself from standing in that truth out of fear of what the repercussions are going to be around me and granted ethics and being a good person is still important so <laughs> you know all of those things but off brand for me is having a conviction about something and doing the opposite it's not mm -hmm. it's not abiding by that that value of freedom that i have to really stand yeah. in who i am and be okay with that 
Amen, sister. I love it. Awesome. Well, I am so happy to have you in the uh, brand geek community here. Uh, this is an amazing conversation. Like I keep saying, we could go on for hours, but we won't guys. So you're going to have to go find Tristan on your own on social media and, and her website, but share where with us where we can find more of you. Yeah. So I would recommend starting with the website. So it's wildwomanhouse.com and it's spelled in a special way. So I would check the show notes for that. Um, We did that intentionally and also accidentally. That's a whole story in and of itself, (laughs) but um, not to take up any more time. I would start at the website because you're going to be able to find absolutely everything linked there. Our socials, our blog, the podcast, our resources, literally everything is there. So I would just head to the wild woman house website and just pick your poison on where you want to go. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I feel like I made a new friend today. (laughs) And we will will keep tabs on you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much.